Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Digital VLSI Design. I'm Professor Adam Thiemann of the NX Labs at Bar-Ilan University, and today we'll be going over the Kahoot for Lecture 11, Chip Finishing and Sign-Off. In today's Kahoot, we'll have eight questions, and the first question is, which of the following causes of delay are part of the delta margin as presented in the timing constraint equations? Is it jitter, crosstalk, OCV derates, or possibly all of the above? I think I'll go with all of the above. So let's go back to the lecture and take a look at why. So remember our timing constraints. This was our max constraint max delay constraint, this was our min delay constraint. And if we look at the vanilla constraints, we have, you know, T, the timing, um, the, 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 the uh, period, is going to be larger than TCQ plus T logic, and taking into account the T setup of the flip-flops. We added to that the delta skew, which is the difference between the time uh, of the clock arriving at the two flip-flops, the start uh, point and the end point flip-flop. And then we, and, and what we did here is we just added this delta margin that says it'll take into account all kinds of things that will show um, throughout the course. This is what we said at the beginning. Um, in addition to that, we had the, Mac, the min delay constraint, which was the launch path, which is TCQ plus T logic is going to be larger than the T, the, the T hold. And we have to take into account the skew between the, um, the register on the start point and the register on the end point. And we added here a delta margin that will take into account all kinds of margins that we have to, uh, that we will see uh, throughout the lecture. Um, now, uh, here we have a bigger than over here. So to make the situation worse, we added the delta margin with a plus sign on this side. And here, because the uh, larger than was over here, we added the delta margin with a minus sign over here. Now we've had the rest of the lectures after the static timing analysis lecture. So what is this delta margin? Where well, the first thing we saw was jitter. And, and we said that jitter, you know, is this random type of thing that we can take into account in all kinds of ways. So that's obviously part of delta margin. We discussed crosstalk. So crosstalk, we could put it in all kinds of, you know, things here like the T-logic or whatever. But I'm just saying it's some sort of a, a an addition or a subtraction from the timing so we can say it's also within this delta margin. OCV derates, same type of thing. OCV is on chip variation and we'll be discussing that in the next question. So that could be in the delta margin and more and more aging and so forth and so on. So basically anything that does not fit into the basic parameters, I just call it part of this delta margin. And again, this is some margin to, in, in, uh, to improve our um, yield and to make sure that we meet our max delay and our min delay um, constraints on um, every piece of fabricated silicon or as many as possible. So going back to the Kuhut itself, jitter, crosstalk, and OCV derates for sure are part of that delta margin. And there are uh, many other things that some of them we discussed in the lecture and some of them uh, didn't. Some of them will be found out, you know, in the coming years. Question number two. What is the set timing derate SDC command used for? Is it used to create best case, worst case, BCWC corners? Is it used to model onshift variation, OCV? Is it used to apply estimated skew? Or is it used to model aging? So the answer is going to be to model onshift variation. And again, let's go back to the slides to know um, what, uh, to remember about this. So onshift variation, or OCV, is the spatial variation. So we have chips, you know, they're not just a singular type of uh, point thing. It's a big thing. And... Um, you know the the um, process has been um, has been fabricated differently in different parts of the chip. It could be you know the chip um, the chip uh, part that was closer to the middle of the wafer or farther away. Um, different types of gradients will be in different um, in different. Um, types of uh, layers that we we grew or that we etched and so forth and so so on. Um, we have delay elements that are going to be on the chip and they're going to be on the clock path of uh, both the launch path and of the um, capture path and they're going to be far away from each other and the same thing is with the elements that we're going to have inside the timing path. So we're, these elements may be spatially far from each other and therefore they're going to undergo different uh, undergo different um, process variation and they're going to also have different you know temperatures due to IR drop 
or um, type uh, or different types of uh, voltage droops at that uh, point in, uh, on the chip um, according to how the power gets to them and they're going to um, undergo different temperatures just because they're far away from each other okay so um, what we're going to do is actually i'm going to assume that it's the worst possible thing so for setup we know that the setup constraint wants to make sure that we the launch path has been you know uh, finished so we, we our data arrives all the way at the end point before you know our uh, period or our capture path has passed so we're going to make this one slower well we're going to make this one faster for for hold um, the problem is that in the same sock, uh, clock cycle on the same clock edge we're going to assume now for a worst case that our launch path um, the data changed here before we actually sampled the previous data that went over here so in this case we're going to make this slower and we're going to make this faster how are we going to do it uh, multiply it by some sort of a factor so for example set timing rate minus max that means it's going to be applied to the max delay this uh, guy over here minus early 0.9 minus late 1.2 so it's going to multiply these by 1.2 uh, the delays through each and every one of these elements and minus late it, uh, minus early it's going to multiply each one of these elements by 0.9 and the same will be done uh, for the min delay just opposite so over here minus early is going to multiply these guys while minus late is going to multiply these guys and that's how we basically our basic modeling of on-chip variation then we went on to discuss all kinds of different types of models to improve that so one of the problems is that with our delta margins that we saw on the previous slide up here um, what we're going to do to try and increase our yield and so forth we're going to put all kinds of things into these delta margins such as that ocv but sometimes it gets so hard that we can't actually you know improve our chip from uh, technology to, from technology generation to technology generation just by you know uh, because we don't meet our uh, equation so what we're going to do is find all kinds of reasons and excuses to reduce the delta margin and that's what i showed you during the lecture different types of uh, more accurate I would say OCV uh, uh, type of modeling. Okay, so let me go back to the coot because I want to go over. So, so basically, to model on chip variation is the correct answer. But what about the other things? To create best case, worst case corners, well, uh, best case, worst case corners are just, you know, taking the slow, slow and the fast, fast corner with the worst case PVT um, and the best case PVT, checking the best case on hold and the worst case on setup, basically. So that's the, I, I would say it's the old um, type of uh, 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 approach. It's also usually the approach taken through during optimization, just not to go and load 100 quarter, uh, corners and check them um, during the optimization process. To, to apply estimated skew no skew is actually deterministic we can measure the skew according to the delay elements we have and according to the rc delays of the um of the clock network of the the, the routing on the clock network and apply it directly into our uh you know timing constraints and to model aging well um, we'll discuss this in a moment but to model aging we actually provide a different characterization for aged uh, uh gates so Luckily, I got that one right. And let's go to question number three. Which extraction corner should we use for setup timing checks? C worst, C best, RC worst, or I can't tell, better check them all. Just to remember over here, we have this graph that shows us the resistance, and it shows us on the Y axis the capacitance, and it gives us these, around the, the space over here, the different C best, RC worst, typical over here in the middle, RC best and C worst. Wow, I don't know which one to choose. I can't tell. Better check them all. So I guess that's not a very great answer uh, that I gave over here, but let's go back to the lecture and just at least remind ourselves what these things are. So we saw this, you know, a graph of the design space of the different types of uh, um, RC. So remember that our delay is going to be, you know, um, proportional to our, uh, our resistance and our capacitance of our um, of our wiring okay we're talking about RC extraction of the back end layers and um, what we would like to do is for a worst case such as a uh, setup corner you know uh, making the delay as long as possible we'd like to take a worst case um, 
R and C values. But the problem is that we have this trade-off because if we take, um, for example, a worst case C, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that, for example, the metal layers over here were wider than they were supposed to be, which means that they're closer to each other and that gives us a higher capacitance factor. However, widening the wires will also reduce the resistance. And this is true for the different uh, options over here. So that's why it's not straightforward to say which is our worst case and which is our best case. Is um, C dominant? Is R dominant? What kind of you know combination of the of the the two? So um, I don't have a good answer except for okay, take all the extraction corners you have for the backend layers and run your timing analysis on all of them, and probably at sign off that's the best thing to do. But it means that you're going to be multiplying by four or by five or even by more the number of corners you have um, versus the starting you know different PVT corners and so forth. Okay, um, just kind of uh, during. Uh, maybe we should say during optimization or at least for the, the most important ones to check, it, you know, only C usually is the, is what affects the cell delay because the cell sees uh, everything um, in some of the models that we took as just a slump type of resistance and the resistance is low, or at least in, in older technologies, it would be low. So we could take, you know, C worse for um, setup and C best for hold. However, once we get long interconnects and especially now at uh, nanometer technologies where the resistance of the wires really has increased and, and becomes a bottleneck, um, maybe we should take something like RC best and RC worst and figure out um, what is our best way to, to apply it or just take all of the different you know options and run sign off with all of them despite the amount of time it will take to run. So for our fourth question, which of the following is not a phenomenon related to aging? Hot carrier injection, time-dependent dielectric breakdown, clock reconvergence pessimism removal, or negative bias temperature instability? Well, I know the option, the yellow one it is for sure, because it has nothing to do with aging actually. So that was to introduce to you, you know, the stuff about aging. So there are different phenomena, and I, I didn't go deeply into it in this course, but you know, there are great courses about reliability and so forth. And uh, there are different uh, types of phenomena, phenomena that um, affect the uh, transistors and the metals and everything over time. So uh, the device characteristics change over time, and the uh, metal layers change over time. So the, 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 the you know, the most well-known one, I guess, is hot carrier injection, which is something that I discussed in the VLSI course. And again, what it does is it changes the VT of the transistor over time according to how much, uh, how long it's basically on. And we also have similar things like negative bias uh, temperature instability, NBTI. That's maybe even more important sometimes in the more uh, modern processes. And uh, time-dependent dielectric breakdown means that the dielectric is actually going to change and eventually break down over time and, and ruin our reliability. Electromigration obviously is uh, one of the is the most important probably um, long-term reliability phenomenon on um, on metal layers okay so we have different ways to deal with it operate with lower vdds model aging as additional timing mar margin used age library models for sign off timing and add aging sensors so really the most common thing to do is to characterize your library with the effects of aging. So assume that we had such and such amount of uh, current flowing through the, the transistors at this and this voltage, at this and this temperature, and we can um, then measure our hot carrier, you know, our effects of HCI and of NBTI and put it into a library, um, you know, into a library uh, characterized lib file and then run it through our, um, our static timing analysis. Um, and see how we're doing. So that is something that is very commonly done. So it provides us more corners to run, basically. Um, these corners are obviously going to be worse. So we have to take into account, is it going to be okay that, um, you know, we're going to, after a certain amount of time, reduce the frequency that our uh, chip is running at or something like that? Or do we have to always meet this worst case where, you know, we have these aged models? 
Um, so that is one thing to do. Um, if we want to actually go and change, you know, our uh, voltage and our frequency according to the aging of the, 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 the chip, we better put aging sensors such as like um, ring oscillators and so forth and measure them all every once in a while according to how much, you know, our um, chip has been on or a certain area of our chip has been on. And then, you know, n knowing that if it, um, if, if it operated this and this amount of time, then we should go and reduce, for example, our frequency or raise our, our voltage or something like that okay so that is basically how we're dealing with aging now I did mention in the Kahoot you know clock reconvergence pessimism removal CRPR or CPPR or CRPP or you can call it whatever you want depends on which company you're working with but that is basically a uh, uh, nothing to do with aging and uh, just to remind you what it is if we go and uh, look back at these derate factors so um, uh, if we if we look at this over here what we we always are we're doing is just multiplying this whole um, you know uh, path by uh, a worst case uh, by a, uh, by a, an additional delay and multiplying this whole path by a um, uh, you know and speeding it up okay but the thing is that here before we branch out to this you know part of the clock tree and this part of the clock tree we're going to have uh, lots of buffers and so forth. And when we talk about, you know, multiplying things, we take the whole launch path from the clock source all the way through until the end point. And we talk about the capture path, we take the clock source all the way through until the capture, you know, the, the, uh, the capture point, the clock of the capture um, uh, flip-flop. So what we're doing is we're actually assuming that all these clock buffers, you know, that they're separate entities in, in the world, they're super, uh, you know, they have this superposition or something. And that's obviously not true. It can't be that this, uh, you know, this guy over here has a, a, a low VDD and a high VDD at the same time, or that it was, um, it was uh, fabricated as a slow device versus and then as a high, uh, fast device, uh, even though it's the same exact device. So CPPR or CRPR, it just takes you know, the, um, the delays of these guys and doesn't and removes the, the multiplication factors and removes any type of worst case that it applied, you know, to this um, common ground that's between them until this branch off of the clock tree into the two sides. So let's go back to the Kahoot now. And question number five, why do we add decoupling capacitance? Decaps. To reduce the crosstalk between fast transitioning signals, to filter voltage fluctuations on the power supplies, to limit the Miller effect when driving the load, or to protect against voltage spikes due to electromagnetic discharge. Hmm. That's a hard one. Let's read this again. I think it's going to be this to filter voltage fluctuations on the power supplies. So we covered this point when we discussed filler cell insertion. Okay, so as we said, standard cell placement never reaches 100% utilization. We always leave, you know, these areas that are empty between the standard cells to pre perform optimizations, placement legalization, and then, of course, routing so we won't have high congestion. But we need to, you know, ensure that there are continuous wells across the entire row, that we have the VDD and ground follow pin rails, that they're um, continuous and fully connected, and so forth. And we need other layers to pass DRC, such as N plus and P plus, and so forth and so on. We also need to have different uh, densities and so forth uh, over here. So we need to add these fillers. So the question is, why not, if we're already adding fillers, add something useful? And that's what decaps are. So decaps are a cell, it can look something like this, where we have, you know, two MOS caps, an NMOS and a PMOS, which is easy to make in a standard cell type of a layout. And what they do is they add capacitance between VDD and ground. So we have a capacitor over here and a capacitor over here, and there are other structures that can be kind of similar. And then instead of putting, you know, uh, just a filler cell, um, we can put one of these decap cells in these little holes over here. The, the reason um, not to do it, by the way, is because there this does add leakage. So the leakage through the gates over here, it um, does uh, 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 create static power. But why do we do it? Well, in general, what we want to do is we want to have as much um, capacitance as possible between our um, our DC voltages. So our DC voltages, VDD and ground, we want them to be VDD and ground. This is not signals. Signals that are switching all the time, we want to have as little capacitance as possible because um, any capacitance, you know, will have to charge and discharge, causing us uh, delays, causing us uh, power, um, and, and also the coupling will, will cause noise. So we don't want any um, or as low as possible coupling capacitance between um, uh, signals 
signals. But when we're talking about um, DC voltages, these are the, the VDD and ground that are actually, you know, supplying these, the cells, the gates for doing this charging, discharging, we want to have um, a clean uh, voltage supply. We want to have no noise on it. And for that, we want to put as much capacitance as possible. And this is done at many, many different levels. So let's talk about just this level that we're talking about here. If we have um, some sort of gate that needs to switch, let's say we have a buffer that needs to now um, drive, uh, you know, its output load and fill it up with, uh, with, uh, with, with charge, it's going to need, you know, the, the voltage supply. And, it, and we have this big VDD type of, uh, of a supply all around, but you know, it needs, it, it, it's good to put a, a little voltage supply, uh, um, a little capacitor that has this type of um, uh, um, charge in it to, to supply immediately that charge that is needed. So we don't have some sort of a drop in our, um, our power supply uh, uh, level right at that standard cell. And that's what these decaps are trying to do. We do this all over the place. So if we take a look at, uh, you know, our, one of our uh, pictures that we had in our uh, chip and package and board type of a, a, of a lecture before, we see that we have these capacitors and we add these capacitors and we try to add them at every single layer um, of the design. It's much easier to make a big capacitor outside the chip, not in the VLSI layers. So at the VLSI layers, we have these decaps, which are real small. And then we have the capacitance that is basi basically the coupling capacitance between the VDD and ground, um, you know, power supplies running throughout the chip. But that's, again, relatively small in the end. To get really big capacitors, we take external capacitors, you know, that we go and solder onto the, the chip. So we can even do it right on the package itself. We can take the, the bumps or, or the, the wire bonds and really stick capacitors um, on them that are, that are much larger in, in, in their, um, you know, in their values, in their capacitance values. And then we do it along the board and so forth and so on, trying to get as much capacitance as we can between VDD and ground to filter out any type of noise to provide, you know, this extra charge that we need to do these switching operations. So going back to the Kahoot, um, so of course the answer is to filter voltage fluctuations on the power supplies. That's what DCAP is used for. Okay, I mentioned to reduce crosstalk between fast transitioning signals. So for sure, we don't add capacitance to reduce crosstalk. But again, decaps are between VDD and ground, two DC voltages, not between transitioning signals. To limit the Miller effect when driving a load, it has nothing to do with that. That was just a you know type of a funny type of an answer to put there. To protect against voltage spikes due to electromagnetic discharge, well, that's ESD that we discussed during our packaging and I/O um, lecture. Question number six. When do we typically run LEC, logic equivalence check, between the RTL and the gate level following synthesis, between the synthesized netlist and the post layout netlist, after applying ECOs, engineering change orders, to a design, or during every stage of the design when the gates or nets were added or modified? Well, the answer is going to be the green one because we have to do it with each one of these. So let's go back and discuss um, LEC. So LEC or logic equivalence, here we also call it LEQ in, in one type of a way. Um, what is what it's going to do basically, it's going to take uh, at the basic level our Verilog, you know, our RTL, and it's going to check that our RTL and what we, you know, supply in the GTS and the layout in the end is going to be equivalent. Okay, how do we do that? Because it's really tough. Well, what we need to do, what, what we do to turn the Verilog, you know, the RTL into a gate level netlist is we do synthesis over here. So we hope that our tools, you know, they uh, provide us logic equivalents, even though, um, you know, if you're developing a new tool, you have to check that. So what we use is we use a formal verification techniques that go and map our um, our. Our, uh, our RTL to a graph and we map our netlist to, to a graph and then we check that they are really equivalents in a formal type of a verification way and we see that really they have complete Boolean um, equivalence. There are a lot of tricks and caveats over there. So when we do things like inserting clock gating, it changes the Boolean equivalence. When we do things like um, choosing the architecture of 
different IPs like uh, uh, adders or, or multipliers or so forth and so on, you know, that's going to be non-Boolean equivalent. The answer is going to be the same, but it's not going to be uh, Boolean equivalent. And we have to tell our, um, our verification to our, our logic equivalence tool that we did that, that this was an adder because we're going to lose, you know, all the understanding of what it is once we get down to the netlist layer. So right after synthesis, what we're going to do is we're going to run a logic equivalence check and make sure that while we still know what, you know, was an adder at both levels, um, that we can still, you know, uh, ensure logic equivalence. And then we should run this logic equivalence again, knowing this has now become our golden, you know, we know that it fits and it, it is exactly the same as the RTL. We should run it at every stage that we actually did some sort of change to the netlist, like doing logic optimization or uh, inserting ECOs and so forth and so on. And so in the end, we have, you know, a check between, for, for example, what would come in at the beginning of our, um, of our place and route to, to what comes out at the end. And again, this is a check that we hope that the tools really do um, uh, uh, provide logic equivalence, but it's something that we need to check. And especially if we go and we change things manually, it's, it's a must. Okay, so the answer is going to be during every stage of the design when gates or nets were added or modified. All the other ones are correct as well, but uh, the, it's not enough. Okay, question number seven. What is a seal ring used for? To ensure that VDD IO and VSS IO are accessible for VSD protection. To mechanically protect the chip during packaging and handling. To protect the chip from damaging during dicing or to differentiate between separate chips on the same board. Hmm. I think it's going to be the yellow one. To protect the chip from damaging during dicing. And again, let's go and see why. So a seal ring is one of these things that we don't care about, I guess. But at least in academia, when we send in our, you know, our chip to, um, to get taped out, we have to take care of everything often. So one of the things is we'll have to add this seal ring by ourselves. Okay? And a seal ring is basically a guard ring. Okay, it's a bunch of, uh, you know, wells with the contacted wells that um, will collect any type of uh, uh, any type of uh, uh, um, charge that is that is uh, around this area. Okay, and it, it, uh, it, it's used as a barrier between basically between different uh, chips or areas that we're going to cut on our mask. So again, we have our big, you know, um, mask over here. We do somebody does the mask layout. Okay, and make sure that each of these chips fill up the, the whole area and that we can dice them. So we're going to then take a laser and, you know, cut straight lines through this to, in the end, uh, pull out a single chip. Okay, um, well, during that cutting type of uh, operation, that dicing, there's going to be a lot of junk that's going to happen. A lot of charge is going to be thrown around and so forth. And that can go and ruin these, uh, you know, ruin our chip. It can burn out our gates. It can cause, you know... Th things similar to ESD. Okay, so what we do is again we have this um, this guard ring, which is called the seal ring, around our uh, chip, and it's going to be a barrier that's going to collect all this charge and not let this charge go and burn out our chip itself. So that's what a seal ring is. It's you know a bunch of it's a metal stack um, with uh, uh, with uh, you know these diodes around it that are going to collect the charge. So that's what a seal ring is. It is used again for protecting the chip during dicing. Um, by the way, there is a quite large area between chips. This is um, a, a, an area that's called the scribe lines. Okay, it's the area where we're going to cut. And fabs will put in all kinds of metrology in the scribe lines. For instance, they'll put in little ring oscillators that can tell them, you know, how, um, how what the corner is at this in this area of the wafer and different uh, uh, things that help with metrology. So scribe lines are an interesting type of thing. And if you actually have access to a fab, they can even let you put all kinds of chest structures, maybe as a, you know, an academic to test things out for free without making a whole chip. Um, the things in the scribe lines are often uh, obviously going to be destroyed during dicing. But if you have the whole wafer and you can probe right down onto what's going on there, you can do things like check the, the corner and so forth. And so the fab can know exactly what corner each wafer was, uh, was fabricated at. So um, the answer is to protect the chip from damaging during dicing. The fourth answer is also kind of right, to differentiate between separate chips on the same wafer, but you don't need a seal ring for that necessarily. Um, so that's not, our, that's not the reason we put it. Um, 
to ensure that VDDIO and VSSIO are accessible for ESD protection, well, we saw uh, in our lecture about IO and packaging that um, that is done by you know the rings of VDD and ground that we have uh, around the the IO around the periphery of the chip. So it has nothing to do with the seal ring. To mechanically protect the chip during uh, packaging and handling, no, that is what we call the passivation layer, and that's just a layer of a plasticky type of a material that we grow on top of the chip to protect it. So that's not what the seal ring is for. So now we'll go to our final question. When is OPC applied? During layout. This is what the DRCs are derived from. After tape out prior to max generation, within the photolithography machine, or during wafer testing according to measured results. Well, I think it's gonna be after tape out prior to max generation. Okay, so let's remember what OPC is and then get back to the answer to that. So. In general, resolution enhancement techniques, RETs, the most popular or famous one is the OPC. And OPC has been done for many, many years, and it becomes more and more important. So if we just take one of these very uh, small types of cuts in a photo mask and we um, shine light through it, we're going to get all kinds of refractions that they're not going to exactly make the pattern that we wanted. So in our GDS, we drew this nice rectangle over here, but you see that the light intensity changes according to, to you know refraction patterns and so forth. And so what we're going to get is we're going to get something that doesn't exactly look like our very nice, uh, uh, you know, um, laid out uh, rectangle here. And that is obviously going to change our device properties and our metal properties and so forth and so on. So OPC direction uh, corrections are taking, you know, the, the layout over here knowing very well the photolithographic process um, and uh, running it through um, very uh, uh, long and hard algorithms that are going to go and add little types of additions um, as you can see over here the, all these green pixels over here are going to be added to the mask uh, you know slit and then when we we run that um, this guy through uh, the, the, uh, the the photolithography we're going to get a, um, a feature that's much closer to what we wanted. So this is our original layout. This is what we did in our layout editor where everything's you know beautiful and perfect. And then uh, if we do some moderate OPC, you see that we have all these changes over here that are gonna improve the optics. But uh, the farther we go within uh, process technologies, we're gonna have to add more and more aggressive OPC and get really a lot, lot, lot of these little additions, uh, little additions and changes to our rectangles um, that we're gonna apply inside our masks and try to make uh, you know the final result be as close to what we we applied. And this takes a long time. It is not done. Um, you know uh, it, when is it done? So we don't do it uh, by ourselves. It's not part of the layout process. We lay out as if everything is perfect. You know we run our DRCs according to what the um, fab told us that the minimum spacing, minimum width, etc. are, and then we tape out the design like that. The the design goes to mask generation. So this is done during mask generation. They run our um, layout through these very heavy algorithms that take a lot, lot, lot of time to run. It's one of the things that um, creates the cost of the masks, and then they generate the mask according to the OPC that, that they had. Well, once we have it inside our mask, you know, there's nothing to do. That's uh, that that mask is used for generating um, all the chips that we produce. Okay, so um, for the answers during layout, this is what the DRCs are derived from. No, this is not what the DRCs are derived from. Okay, after tape out prior to mass generation, so that's exactly when it's done. We tape out our, you know, our perfect rectangles. They go over to the mass generation place, which runs these algorithms and uh, applies the OPC. Then they make the, 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 the masks. Within the photolithography machine, no, the photolithography machine gets the mask that already has the OPC inside them. And during wafer testing, according to measurement and results, um, so really not, not at all. So um, that was basically our uh, Kahoot for Lecture 11 sign-off. And uh, as always, you can ask me more questions on my YouTube channel, and, I, and I'll be happy to try and answer them. Thank you very much, and uh, see you next time.